Antoinette Smith's first two children were given to their grandparents to care for them when they were very young, as their mother was unable to look after them after some time of attempting to be a single parent. Despite this, a few years later, she would go on to have two more sons, Aaron and Travion, and once more she would attempt to raise these boys on her own. Travion's father was not in the picture, and his mother Antoinette was an alcoholic and a drug user, both of which she abused not only through her pregnancy with these children, but throughout their early lives. Bouncing around from public housing to friends' places, Travian and Aaron would eventually go to separate homes as their brothers had before them. Aaron would live with his biological grandmother, and Travian with his father. Travian's father, Michael Clark, was said to not like his son at all, initially not even wanting the child to be born. And Travian's situation, although improved from his mother's care, was still far from troubled. In his later teenage years, he would have a son of his own, and this upset his father very much, causing turbulence between the two, and eventually leading to Travian getting kicked out of the house at the age of 20. Floating between couch surfing and homelessness, Travian would eventually meet Ronald Anthony, and the two quickly became best friends. 23-year-old Ronald Anthony was no stranger to the wrong side of the law. He was known by friends to be in and out of courtrooms through most of his adult life for a variety of crimes. One of them being, at the age of 18, he called a bomb threat in to a high school in February of 2008. Then, from nearby bushes, he would watch the police descend upon the school, and when the building was surrounded, he would take a mask and a knife, and with a female accomplice, they would go to rob a nearby bank. Standing inside of the bank, and before the robbery had begun, it is said that Ron lost his nerve, and both customers and employees alike had begun to become suspicious of his presence there. He was later questioned by police, and ended up confessing to the bomb threat and attempted armed robbery. Ron was known to be an incredibly charismatic and magnetic person. People would always find themselves drawn to him, and he had multiple girlfriends all at the same time, many of which did not know of each other. Ron did not have a stable location to live, and he often jumped between living at different girlfriends' houses and his mother's. His mother would always drive him between these locations, to court hearings, and she even would be known to pick up his friends to take them to various places. One of Ronald's ex-girlfriends, her name is Amber Alberts, would testify as to what sort of relationship the two shared. I met him in June of 2009. Um, we were an on and off relationship. It was a bad relationship. Um, we stopped talking for years and then he got out of prison and then we started talking again and then we got back together. He cheated a lot with a lot of different girls. And I guess I can say I was young. I was pretty much stupid. I didn't listen. I guess I had to learn on my own. Um, and there was a lot of girls, a lot of them. You had a romantic relationship with Ron? Yes. And you did not realize that his girlfriend was still Amber Alberts? No. Okay, and that he was still living with Amber Alberts? No. And you considered him to be your boyfriend? Yes. And you loved him? Yes. He had emotional control over you? Yes. Mental control over you? Yes. And he was sometimes abusive towards you? Yes. He would hit you? And sometimes he would leave bruises? Yes. Sometimes he would say, if you love me, you'll do such and such for me? Yes. He would ask for money? Yes. It was difficult for you to say no to him? Yes. He has a really bad temper? Yes. Both of these women, Amber Alberts and Sarah Redden, would testify to the different sorts of control that Ronald had over them. As the man had no job, they would provide him with money, a place to live, clothes and food. He would come and go as he pleased, and they would never question him to his whereabouts, sometimes not seeing him for days on end. He also had no phone, so he would use both of theirs on a regular basis, and they would both never check the messages that he sent, nor question him as to what he was using their phones for. After meeting Travian Smith, who at the time was homeless and had nowhere to go, Amber and Ronald allowed Travian to move in with them, and at this point, the two men became inseparable. No one in either of their lives ever saw one without the other, and the two men would now refer to each other as brothers. Travian would always be wearing Ronald's clothes and shoes, 
and whoever's house Ronald had found himself sleeping at, Travian would be there too, when Ronald's mother would pick him up from Amber's house to go to court hearings. Both Ronald and Travian would pack book bags full of clothes and head to the hearings together. Amber would say that at these times, she would expect not to see them both for a number of days. This now leads us to the day of May 13th, 2013. As she had done many times before, Ronald's mother picks up her son and Travian from his girlfriend Amber's house early in the morning. The two have book bags packed full of clothes, and the men are driven to Ronald's court hearing. When the hearing is over, the two men then meet up with Ron's other girlfriend, Sarah Redden. Ron's mom was driving, and it was uh, Ron and Trey in the car. They came and picked me up. It was late afternoon. And again, where did you go? North Hills Mall. We just walked around. We stopped at Moe's and sat there for a while. We walked in the, st uh, the store. We just walked around. We started filling out job applications. We were filling out our applications, me and Trey, and Ron was in the bathroom. And um, me and him were talking, me and Trey was talking about what, you know, to put on the app, on the application. And he asked, should he put it? Um, if he ha had a felony or not before. And one of the workers walked past us and heard us talking about it and stopped and was like, y'all shouldn't lie on the application. It wouldn't be good. You won't get the job. They were filling out applications in the back side of the store. There's kind of a bar on the side. And they were standing beside each other filling out the applications. And um, they were kind of arguing amongst themselves. And I you know, didn't pay a lot of attention. I walked past and was going to go to the restroom. Um, and the female um, kind of snapped at me and told me, you know, somebody's in there. And so I kind of stepped back and um, was listening to what they were saying. Um, they didn't realize I was the manager. I was not in uniform. They were saying, you know, no, you have to put that. That's the one phrase that I specifically remember hearing. I don't remember everything else they said, but I remember hearing that phrase, no, you have to put that. Um, so that's, that's, that's where I stepped in and um, said, you guys are, you know, you're arguing, you're arguing in the store, you know, like, I can hear what you're saying. You might as well not even fill out these applications. I'm the manager. Um, you know, you're not going to get a job here, and you probably leave the store. You're being disruptive, you know. We told Ron what she said, and he went back in there and yelled at her for getting in our business. I could see that um, Mr. Anthony was very angry, and I recognized it as a situation that could may or may not, you know, go whatever way. So I um, kind of opened the door. He was leaning in. I kind of didn't push him, but pushed my way out the door, and I saw a security officer. So I motioned for him to come over. I think I may have, you know, yelled out something like, hey, or something to the effect of that, and he came over pretty quickly and responded. They just told us to get off the... The, prim the property the premises. A few hours after this altercation, at around 7 p.m., Ronald attends a Marijuana Anonymous meeting where both Sarah and Travian join him. This is something that the three had done together before. Even though Sarah and Travian were not required to attend these meetings, they would still go to support Ron. The meeting ends at around 9 p.m. and the trio begin to walk around nearby neighborhoods. We walked down Six Forks towards North Hills Mall. We didn't go to North Hills Mall. They were going into different neighborhoods. Ron and Trey would check for unlocked cars, and they would get into any cars that was unlocked to find whatever they could find. GPSs, headphones, um, change. If there was any money, they would take money. Sometimes wallets. They would get into the wallets. When they would go check for in the cars, I would stand by the street and, you know, watch around to see if anybody was coming or coming out the houses or anything. I woke up rather unexpectedly. I had fallen asleep on the couch, um, and I got up and walked to my bedroom window, and I, I, I don't know why, but I uh, peeked through the blinds and observed a burglary in process directly across the road from me. Right across from my bedroom window, I uh, was in the townhomes, um, a fellow lived with a small red Miata convertible. And I observed um, a 
tall gentleman with a long flashlight burglarizing the car. There was a woman standing there in the middle of the road. And once I um, realized that the burglary was in process, it occurred to me that she was probably some sort of lookout. A third person came around um, in the around the town home, and he also um, had a black bag f f full of things. My GPS was missing, so I, I discovered it when I checked my car. And anything else going out of the car that you noticed? Um, well, it's sort of embarrassing, a bag of Cheetos. <laughs> The police came immediately and I was able to give my description. They were gone by the time the officer got there. We cut through that neighborhood and we ended up in another neighborhood and it had some, you know, really nice big houses. We proceeded on to apartment, the apartments. The apartments that were still in construction were all lit up on the outside and there was no cars. On the other side, there was apartments that were dark and there was five, like four or five cars in front of them. Ron and Trey said that they were going to go check something, and they told me to wait there. So I waited there while they took off. How long would you say that you waited there in, in the apartment under construction? Um, five, ten minutes. They come walking up, and they tell me to stay there until they come back and get me, and they leave again. They went back in the same direction they were coming towards the occupied apartment. I kept going to see if I could find them. And that's when I ended up where the occupied ap apartment was in front of the cars. A police car came around, and I went in the breezeway where the stairs were, and I, and I sat there and I hid. At first, I thought they left, but I didn't think they would do that. So I was just waiting till that police car left, and I was going to come back out and start calling their names to see where they were at. I waited another minute or so, and when I thought that it was gone, I came out and I was whispering their names and I heard something that made me look up and when I looked up I seen Trey on the balcony of the second floor. He was wiping off the rails. And how was he wiping off the rails? Using his shirt. He looked at me and was like, what's up? And I said, we, needed, we need to leave. The police just came by. And I asked him where Ron was and he pointed behind him towards the apartment. The occupied apartment building that Ronald and Travian had chosen to enter was a newly constructed one, with only a few residents having moved in at this time. Underneath this balcony that Sarah saw Travian standing on, on the first floor was the leasing office for that entire building. Ronald and Travian had initially broken into that office and stolen two Lenovo laptops, and after doing that, they decided to see what the occupied apartment above this office had in store for them. The person who lived in this apartment was 30-year-old Melissa Huggins-Jones, along with her 8-year-old daughter, Hannah. The two had just recently moved into this place, less than two weeks prior to these night's events. Ms. Wallace, how are you related to um, the victim in this case, Melissa? I'm her mother. I helped her find the apartment. I came with her and met with her here a few times, and we had looked at different places. and, and We she... thought that it was a great fit for her. She was close to her schools. That's part of the reason she chose those apartments because she felt safe there and it was close to her school. It was close to her job. She could drop the kids off, you know, easily in the mornings to school and, and be at work within, you know, 10 minutes. She was glad to have a new beginning and a new start and the kids, she, she was looking forward to being close to home, to her family. Melissa had moved from Tennessee back to Raleigh after a divorce from the father of her two children, a man that she had been with since leaving high school. She not only wanted to be closer to family who lived nearby, but an opportunity with the bank that she worked with had presented itself so that she could transfer within the company that she had built her life around. Everything seemed perfect, as the apartment that she found was described by her as peaceful and safe. Melissa's only complaint with the new place was that the aircon was not working, and because of this, she needed to sleep with the sliding door to her balcony open to keep the place cool at night. Her 11-year-old son Noah was to soon join them living there, and had only stayed back in Tennessee so that he could finish his school year first. 
On this night, Melissa was sleeping after a day of family visits because Mother's Day had recently gone by. Her daughter, Hannah, was sleeping in the room on the other side of the apartment, and in the early hours of the morning of the 14th, Ronald Anthony creeps through the balcony sliding door as Travian is wiping down the railing on the balcony. Sarah, who is under this location, soon spots another police vehicle coming towards the mall again. I seen headlights coming back down the um, apartment, around the apartment, and so I hid, and that's when a cop car, I don't know if it was the same one or a different one, came back around and stopped and was using a light to, you know, look around. I wanted to leave because they weren't coming, so I decided myself to leave. So I went up the stairs I was hiding under and down the other stairs to the um, other side of the apartments. As soon as I got off of the stairs, Ron was coming up towards me to, from my left. He wasn't acting scared or upset or anything. He just, you know, was just said, we need to go. I went over the fence, and he said he was going to go find Trey. When you saw Ron and Trey there at the fence line, how, how were they acting at that point? They just looked like they were, they wanted to leave really quick. One had laptops in his hand, the other one had water bottles that they were putting in to boot bags. We all started out running, but I couldn't keep up because of my asthma, so they were way ahead of me. When I got to North Hills, I met up with them. They were stopped in the North Hills um, mall parking area. Ron had a water bottle that he was pouring over his hands, and when he was done, he handed it to Trey, and he did the same thing. He called Reese to come pick us up, and then he gave me my phone back, and we waited till he got there. Ron got in the front passenger. I got behind the driver and Trey was sitting beside me. What did you see Ronald Anthony do there in the car? He had a, he was showing the driver a iPhone. And then um, after that, he had a knife in his hand. And what did you notice on that knife? Blood. What did you notice on Travion at this point? He was looking down at the bottom of his shirt, and when I looked over it, it looked to be specks of blood on the on his shirt. When I seen that knife and then his shirt, you know, it's got, it's got me worried, so I'm at, I, I don't know what happened. I ask him, you know, what's going on, and he tells me to let it go, don't ask questions, just forget about it. The two men spend about half an hour in this strip club, while Travian and Sarah wait outside smoking cigarettes. When the men come out, Ronald suggests that the three of them now get a room in a nearby Super 8 motel. Nobody's really talking, but I see Trey take out, you know, GPSs and headphones and things. He's looking at certain things in his book bag. What specifically did Travion say in terms of what was going on that night? Um, he asked Ron, like, what the hell just happened? I mean, he was kind of nervous sounding. He wasn't mad, he wasn't loud or soft. It was just kind of a nervous question. Trey was just like, man, I got a son, like, I got a son. Like, he was, he was nervous about not seeing his son. Yes, there was a conversation about them being happy that the a little girl did not wake up. 7 a.m. that morning. Construction workers arrive at job sites around the area for buildings that are still being constructed. And this is right near where Melissa and her daughter live. It was a little chilly that morning, but uh, other than that, you know, it wasn't raining or anything. Uh, just a little, little chilly, though. Well, there was, uh, of course, the Spanish uh, crowd that we, we had there, uh, they were working. Uh, they always energetic bunch and get in there and go to work early. and. Uh, it was people all around me uh, working. Uh, my crew hadn't got in the people that I was working with because, uh, like I said, I started a little early that morning, but uh, there was people working all around, yes, sir. I was running uh, the sweeper, like I said, and uh, at one point uh, I looked up and I saw this uh, child standing uh, at the fence and she had her hands locked in the fence and she was crying. Standing there in a nighty and barefoot. Uh, so I got my attention, so I cut the sweeper up and got down 
and went and asked her what was wrong. And uh, she told me that she tried to wake her mother up and couldn't. She had blood all over her face. And she needed her show and she needed to get dressed because she had to go to school. That's what she said. She looked to be about maybe six or seven years old. Knew something had what was wrong, so you know, I told her to stay right there until I could get around there to her. And uh, when I got around the gate to the street that I could come down to meet with her, uh, I got was able to radio my superintendent and um, get him down there. And I uh, told him we had a situation. And uh, we both, at that time, jointly decided to go ahead and call 911 and started going up the uh, stairs uh, as we were talking to 911, actually, at the same time. Because, you know, it, I felt like if it was anything I could do, I would try to, to do what I could, you know, before they got there. Yeah, she, I had her by the hand. She, she was with me all the way up. Well... We got to the top of the stairs, and I let I let Hannah open the door. I let the child open the door to go in her apartment. And immediately, as soon as she did, I stepped in front of her, and Mr. Finn stepped behind me, so Hannah was in the back of the bus. Um, I, want, I asked her, I said, where is your mother at? And she said, the uh, last room on the left-hand side. So I walked down the hallway, and that's where I encountered uh, Miss uh, Jones. She was laying on the bed. It was everywhere. And uh, I put two fingers on her wrist, and there was no pulse, and she was cold as a block of ice, and I was steadily talking to EMS. They were asking me to do this and that, and I just told them that it was just too late for that. We did not let her in the room um, any time during, during that. She stayed behind me and Mr. Finn. Uh, we made sure she did. And, uh, that way she wouldn't have to go through that again. Hi, this is 911. What's the address of your emergency? Yes, ma'am. I need uh, the emergency vehicle at 441 Alistair. Uh, it's an apartment complex, ma'am. It's a kid out here in the street. It says her mom's got blood all over and she couldn't get to the phone. I guess I could go up there. Please, that would be... Let me, let me, let me go to the apartment, ma'am. Once I got um, my equipment, we got out of the truck and we walked upstairs into the apartment and um, that's where we saw the, I believe there was um, two construction workers on scene and um, the engine company that was in the apartment. I saw that there was a girl um, standing with an older gentleman in the living room kind of towards a window or sliding glass door and um, I asked her to come with me. I picked her up and went right back to my ambulance. She, I think, just thought her mom was sick and just needed help. I told her that people were helping your mom. 
and um, I just tried to keep her as busy as I possibly could. I let her eat my lunch. Um, I gave her a lot of candy, stickers, typical things that we kind of carry on our ambulance. I showed her how our heart monitor works and she um, made lots of butterflies and hearts and colored and... I'm gonna ask if you recognize States Exhibit 8. What is States Exhibit 8? Uh, that's a heart that Anna made me and asked me to hold on to it. Um, and just and just to hold on to it and I did um. I actually pulled in the parking lot directly behind the ambulance and the back doors of the ambulance were open and I could see uh, the young girl sitting inside the ambulance with the paramedics and we conducted a security sweep of the apartment just walked through there was a, a significant amount of blood uh, on the bed there was blood spatter on the on the wall to our right on the opposite wall from where she was laying. Also noticed that the, there were um, many blinds that were on the window that were significantly damaged. Um, it was pretty clear to me that there was had been a struggle in the room. And then once we've got the scene secured, we back out, allow the detective uh, division to bring their personnel in because they are, that's what they do, and they do it well. Her face was um, what appeared to be smashed in. Uh, her nose looked like it had been totally dis detached from her face. Uh, teeth were missing. The teeth that were there um, were not appeared to not be in the proper place. Uh, there was puncture wounds about her her head and neck. Um, and as we were examining the body, we found teeth um, in the bed. She had several injuries on her body. Most of the injuries that she had um, exhibit a combination of blunt and sharp force trauma. Not counting the bruises on her extremities, it was at least 18 different blows. Most of them were concentrated in the um, face, a few in the neck, and in the upper chest. I got a phone call as I was getting in my car to go to work. Um, I didn't understand at the time, and in fact, I didn't even realize who it was, um, that he told me that he was, I believe he told me he was at Melissa's apartment and that something was horribly wrong and that I needed to come there. And I just, it's like I, I heard it, but I didn't hear it. I didn't understand. And I went inside. And I told my husband, you know, that I'd gotten a phone call that something was wrong with Melissa. And he said, well, is she okay? I said, I don't know. He said, well, who called? I said, I don't know. So I just hit redial on my phone and I called the person back. And, um, and I asked him if she was okay. He said no. A small amount of money, some jewelry, and Melissa's iPhone were all taken from her apartment that night. The next day, Travian and Ron get a lift from his mother back to the Walmart where Amber works. Ron borrows Amber's phone and takes a number of photos of the laptops that they had stolen, and he then sends these photos to one of his friends called Michael McCullum, asking if Michael would be able to sell these laptops for him. He sent me pictures of the orange laptop, and um, I saw that the, it was up and running, maybe needed cleaning or repair, viruses or whatever. So I took the pictures and I posted them directly to Craigslist. I put the laptop pictures up maybe 5.30 p.m., and by 7 I was getting a phone call. I got a call um, maybe about 7 o'clock that evening about this laptop from um, a guy saying that he would like to purchase it. And... Um, he wanted to purchase it for $800, free and clear, which in that line of work, it seems kind of fishy. Why? Because no one ever offers you exactly what you want for a laptop on Craigslist, ever. I came across a Craigslist ad where a person was selling a Lenovo laptop. On the uh, Craigslist, the uh, seller listed a phone number to contact uh, if someone was wishing to purchase it. And I called that number and I uh, represented myself as a buyer who was interested in buying the computer. Uh, we agreed that we would meet at the Walmart in Wake Forest, and he would be driving his, um, his blue Mitsubishi. And we agreed to meet, meet at, I believe, 4.30 in the afternoon. 
It scared me to death. I took the posting down and I called Ronald instantly and said, what's going on? He told me that they were hot. He told me that there was something, uh, he had did something with those laptops, would not tell me specifically what he did, but he told me that they shouldn't have been on Craigslist. You go into any other details? No, sir. On one of the photos posted for the Craigslist ad, the orange Lenovo laptop displays its serial number on its screen. Detectives run this serial number against the numbers of the stolen laptops and confirm that this is a match. On the 20th of May, a week after the murder, police wait for Michael McCullum at the Walmart to complete this transaction. Michael, having become aware that the laptops were stolen and that police may be the ones who contacted him, he never shows up. A warrant is quickly obtained to search Michael's residence and surveillance is posted outside of his house on the 21st of May. Whilst surveilling Michael's house, the officers notice a group of people leaving the property. We saw some activity where it was one male and two females that exited uh, Mr. McCollum's home and entered into uh, that vehicle that he was known to operate, which was that Mitsubishi vehicle. We followed the vehicle uh, to the Walmart, where it parked in a general parking space, and uh, I parked nearby as well. Um, I observed the male subject, who was later identified as Mr. Travion Smith, and two females all exit the vehicle and walk into the Walmart. Shortly after, uh, maybe a 20, 30 minute time frame, uh, only the two females returned to the vehicle and drove off. Sorry, and drove off. Um, the two females in that Mitsubishi vehicle were followed by the other assisting detectives, and I stayed in the area uh, attempting to locate this male that I had not identified. About five minutes later, um, in a nearby parking lot of another shopping center next to the Walmart, I observed uh, the same individual, Mr. Smith, now sitting in the passenger seat of a different vehicle, which was a small gray car. I, I don't remember the make or model. At that time, he was engaged in a conversation with another uh, black male standing next to the vehicle and two other females, I believe. Um, the other black male, I believe his name was Ronald Anthony. The Wake Forest Police Department came in, um, I guess had a search warrant for my premises and, and arrested me and took my fiance, her friend, down for questioning to the Atlantic Avenue homicide. Upon searching Michael's residence, police discover one of the Lenovo laptops in question. Michael tells the police that it was just delivered by a man named Travian Smith, who had dropped the laptop off, and then his fiancée gave him a lift to the Walmart. Michael also alerts police that all of his conversations regarding these stolen electronics has been with Ronald Anthony. Over in the Walmart car park, Travian and Ronald are identified by the surveilling officers, and both are brought in for questioning. Initially, Travian denies any involvement with the robberies on May 13th, but after some questioning, he reveals a different story. Do you understand what's going on right now? I am telling you that you have two people that you were with that are accusing you of murder. Okay? Okay. Well, let's go. Let's talk about it. How am I supposed to know? This fucking you saying you didn't do anything? I mean, tell me. Explain to me what happened. Okay. I just 
sit here on the stairs, I hear a quick scream. Like, get up. Like, you hear a quick scream? Like what? Like what kind of scream? Was he screaming? No. What did it sound like to you? It was like a, like a scared, horrifying thing. And then, I don't know what the hell he did, but it was like this five and a half, ten minutes before he even came over there where I was. He didn't tell me what happened. I was like, where did you hear that scream? He was like, yeah. I'm like, where did it come from? He was like, I don't know. But I heard it though. It's pretty much all he said. So you're telling me that you never 100% went upstairs and went into that apartment? Never. Why is he putting it on you? I mean, do you understand this is the biggest charge anybody can face? I know. I mean, this is, you're talking murder. I mean, this ain't breaking into stuff. This ain't for this. This is murder. <clears throat> and the court is going to look at this and say, this lady died for a damn iPhone? I don't even have an iPhone. Well, never that is. That's another issue. Here you. That's another issue. But there's one missing, and he's saying you took it. I'm just telling you. So did he take it down? Every day, if he said something about it, I thought I didn't know nothing about it. I thought all I knew about is the laptops and a couple GPS. That's all. You have children, don't you? I have one son. How old is your son? He's one. I don't even know what anybody would tell me if something like that happened to my baby mom. That's why these people need answers. They need the truth. I don't want to be paranoid because I don't know what went on. So I'm trying to spend what you call a happy place and just think, like, pretty much hope for the best. Yeah. That's pretty much what I was doing. I didn't even go to sleep. <laughs> I didn't go to sleep like my mom was so fucked up. Just for breaking the cars? No, from hearing that lady scream, like, it sounded like a horrifying scream, like, like something that you would hear on a horror movie type shit, right? Like, it sounded like that. Over the next three weeks, law enforcement continue their investigation, and throughout this period they collect a range of electronics that link Ron, Travian, and Sarah to the car robberies that took place on May 13th. All of the recovered items were found in Amber Albert's house, and she was said to have been incredibly cooperative through this process, even contacting law enforcement after they had left to let them know that she had found an iPod in her house which did not belong to her. That, that purple iPod, can you describe it for us, ma'am? It was really small. Um, I knew it had a screen, it had some tape on it. It was kind of messed up a little bit. Um, it wasn't in the best condition, but it was pretty nice. It was color, it was purple, and I remember it saying Claire's iPod. How many times would you say that you saw Travion handling that iPod? Uh, in the beginning, he would just listen to the music. It wasn't really his type of music. Um, it was kind of girly, so he would listen to it. Um, Eventually, he tried to put music on it, but of course, we don't have internet out in Oxford, so you couldn't really do much. So I guess he just dealt with what music was on there. Tell me how you know it's definitely yours. Because of the way the screen is shattered and how the scotch tape is on it. And have you seen that iPod since May 14th or May 13th of 2013? Mm-mm. 
make sure for the court reporter, just make sure you say yes or no. She oh, says, okay, um, like no, I have not. I've thought about it and I'd like it back. Another part of the investigation was to gather all of Ron and Travian's clothes, something which Amber also assisted with. At one point, she had even given the police a letter that Ron had sent to her whilst he was being held after the murder. This letter requested that she get rid of all of his clothing that he was wearing that night. All three individuals, Sarah, Travian and Ronald, were charged with first degree murder. At the time of Travian's trial, Ronald had already pleaded guilty so that he could avoid the death penalty. Sarah and Travian, on the other hand, would go to trial rather than plead guilt. And an interesting thing to note is that although Sarah's charges were eventually dropped to accessory after the fact, at the time of her testimony here, when she was facing first degree murder, she had not been offered any sort of plea deal that would assist her in exchange for her testimony. A lot of items were gathered and submitted as evidence throughout this trial. Clothing that the two wore that night, footprints from in and around the apartment that were removed from the carpeting, stolen electronics, GPS devices, music players, and much more. Along with this, witness testimony would also place the three at the car robberies and around the apartments at the time of Melissa's murder. Even though an enormous amount of evidence was gathered, there were no fingerprints recovered. Instead, a variety of cloth imprints were found, consistent with glove marks. Both Travian and Ronald confirmed that they were wearing gloves when they were partaking in the car robberies. Ronald's footprints were found inside of the apartment, whereas Travian's were only found on the balcony railing and on the vent leading up to the balcony. Neither of the men's DNA was found in the apartment at all, and none of the clothes that were tested or recovered were found to have any blood on them. So not having a large amount of direct evidence to link Travian to this murder, the state would rely heavily on circumstantial evidence. And in this process, they had put a focus on Travian's behavior in the days after the murder. Travion Smith's demeanor when you saw him that morning as um, well. I was in a holding cell. Um, we had split me, Travion, and Ronald up. Um, I was in a holding cell with other individuals being processed. And um, they had brought Travion in, I guess, to use the phone in this holding cell. And all I saw was blankness in his eye. He was smiling, pretty much talking about his baby mother crying about him being involved in a murder. That's all I saw. After two weeks of testimony, the state begins their closing arguments. They would highlight the fact that the medical examiner identified at least two different weapons that caused Melissa's injuries. And they would say that even if Travian did not stab her, they believe that he had inflicted at least one of the other blunt force wounds. And due to this, he was a part of the murder. Ladies and gentlemen, Ronald Anthony is a murderer. He stood in this very courtroom and pled guilty to killing Melissa Huggins Jones. He is a murderer. But that's not the whole story. That's not where it ends. They want to blame 100% of this on Ronald Anthony. Where is the evidence from this witness stand that Ronald Anthony made Travion Smith do anything? They talk to you in opening statements about how Ronald Anthony is manipulative and how he's driving the train here. Where is the evidence that Ronald Anthony made Travion Smith do a thing that night? I'd love to be able to come in here and walk in here and say, yep, Travion's DNA was found all over the place. But it's always not that easy, especially when someone's wearing gloves. So they're not, their prints aren't there. There's no Ronald Anthony or Travion or Sarah Redden print there. But it also corroborates the story that they were wearing gloves. And again, circumstantial evidence. I'd submit to you Sarah seeing him on the balcony is direct evidence. But everything else leads you to putting that puzzle, to, puzzle together that he was part of the burglary. And if he's part of the burglary, he's part of the felony murder. With arguably what is no direct evidence being presented by the state, in the defense's closing, they would place a large focus on this gap in their argument. We are now ready for the final closing argument in this case. Mr. Brown. Thank you.
Good afternoon. We are not here to decide whether the death of Melissa Huggins Jones was horrible, tragic, and completely heartbroken, breaking, because it was clearly all of that. And we're not here to decide whether Travion Smith broke into cars, sold a stolen computer, or was hanging around with Ronald Anthony. All of that happened, and none of it's ever been disputed. What we are here to decide is who is responsible for Melissa Huggins Jones' death, and more specifically, has the state proven beyond a reasonable doubt that Travian Smith is guilty of first degree murder. A large portion of the defense's closing statement would see them pick apart the state's key witness, Melvin Brown. This witness did not actually use their real name and did not allow for himself to be filmed or recorded during this testimony out of fear for his safety. Melvin Brown is a prison inmate serving 10 years for trafficking heroin, and on the stand he would recall an interaction that he had had with Travian when they were behind bars together. Here is a direct reading from the court documents summarizing what Melvin had testified to. Quote, They had broken into a house, Travian and another guy, and that is how he got the laptop. He took the laptop, like $200 and some jewelry. He told me while he was in the place robbing it that the lady confronted him. She started yelling at him and he told me that he jumped on the lady. He was hitting her and she was screaming and stuff. And then he said that his co-defendant had stabbed the lady with a knife, stabbed her in the temple and stabbed her in the chest. Defendant also told Brown that the police did not have the knife and that he was confident police would not find blood on the shoes that he was wearing on the night of the murder. End quote. The state would argue that Melvin Brown is a credible witness because of the details and information that he knows about the crime were things that were not released to the media. Only someone who was there on the night or directly involved with the investigation would be able to recall many of the things that he testified to. But just as the state would say that their witness is credible, the defense would argue that he is not that he cannot be trusted, as he not only has mental health issues which cause him to hear voices, but that testifying in this trial had gotten him substantial time removed from his current sentence. Melvin Brown is the one, is the only person in this case who says that Travian attacked Melissa Huggins Jones, participated in her killing, and even puts him in the, the apartment. And you have to decide whether to give him any credibility. You saw no evidence of any fingerprints. You saw no DNA. The footprints that they had, there was one in the house, but they never were able to match that with anybody. All the footprint evidence, shoe print evidence that they had was him outside of the apartment. There was no DNA linking Travion to this. There were no fingerprints. It was only Ronald Anthony who had a knife. No evidence at all of Travian having any type of weapon that night. Only Ronald Anthony. Even if you believe that he was at the balcony, they cannot prove that he broke into that apartment and that he is not guilty simply because of his presence. He's also not guilty because he broke into cars or any other activity, criminal activity that you believe occurred before or afterwards. They have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Travian Smith was involved. And in this case, they have not done so. They cannot do so. It was hard if they tried. Travian Smith is not guilty of this to be murder, and we should not find him guilty of this to be murder. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Brown. With both sides having concluded their closing arguments, the jury comes to a decision. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, your four, four person has returned a verdict in file number 13 CRS 211979, the state of North Carolina versus Travion Smith. We, the jury, by unanimous verdict, find the defendant Travion Smith to be guilty of first degree murder of Melissa Huggins Jones. Answer yes. Having found Travion Smith guilty of first degree murder, 
the state would pursue the death penalty, as they argue the aggravating factors are present for this punishment. Throughout the penalty phase of the trial, to confirm whether Travian would be sentenced to die or not, his defense would present a range of people from his childhood, all testifying as to what sort of life he lived and what sort of person he is. Early 90s, I lived in, in the Raleigh area. It was classified as public housing, so that is what I lived in. And they had a little park down below the hill where kids could go and play. How old was Travion then? He was a child, a little baby, very so young. young. So young that you would call him a baby? Yes. <laughs> and uh, what did you call, what was the name that you knew him by? Pico. Well, there were times when they were without food, without heat, without hot water, running around with diapers on that were so soaked it was unreal. The kids had a bed, but it wasn't the greatest. It was more like a mattress, I remember, on the floor, but it was a bed. And with um, Pico being as small as he was, it kind of worked, but didn't. This is what really angered me the most, is if she couldn't get him to go to sleep, she would slip alcohol in their bottles or whatever she could to get them to go to sleep so that they would get tired. She had given one of them a bottle of beer and I thought it was apple juice until I realized it was beer. My name is Antoinette Smith Yarborough. Okay. And what's your relationship to uh, Travion Smith? It's my baby boy, my son. Okay. And um, how many children do you have? I have four boys in all. Travion Smith's father, what's his name? Michael Clark. <laughs> You know, he he get physical with me, but, you know, after the day I left, and tried to punch me or something like that, yeah. I think you said he tried to punch you in the stomach. Yes, because he didn't want the baby from me, that's what I'm thinking. He didn't want the baby, but I had him anyway, you know, because that's my baby boy, <coughs> like all of them is. I returned him in, turned her in, wrote reports to CPS over the kits and the conditions and what was going on with them. Actually, I didn't know anything about it till they came knocking on my door. And I knew it was my mother, I knew it, was, it wasn't my parents, so it had to be someone staying in our neighborhood. So I finally figured out who it was. Okay. And it was like spraying rumors, but <clears throat> the lady came out to my house, she said she didn't see anything wrong with my house. I told her I always keep my house clean. And she said, she said, yes, it's like it's pretty clean to me. I said, that's why I keep my house clean. So the worker, uh, newly assigned social worker, uh, who's new to the case, uh, do goes in and, and essentially says, walking in the home, I immediately saw what was uh, described in the report, that things were disheveled, the, there were bottles with, that had crusty uh, residue on them and in them. Um, the, the children seemed to have diapers that needed to be changed, and uh, so she proceeded to uh, to investigate and work with the mom to re start remedying those uh, what she found. After September of 1994, you weren't uh, you weren't you didn't have any of your boys in your home after that. Does that sound like about the right date? Yes, right. Yes. All of Travian's brothers ended up living with their respective grandparents, his eldest two going to their new home before Travian is even born, and then the brother closest in age to him, only a year and a half older, whose name is Aaron, leaves his mother's care around the age of five, and within a few short months, Travian goes to live with his father, Michael Clark. Now that the boys are at different households, they see each other less and less, and Aaron's grandmother, on the stand, recalls some moments that she saw Travian growing up. I think he was about 10, he came by. I don't know who uh, had brought him. And Aaron gave him several pair of jeans and shirt and he was just uh, outside, I was so excited. He said, boy, you hooked me up. And a few years went by before we saw him again. And he came by one day and he had hooked school. And I fed him and I said, now you know, you definitely need to be in school. Go home and please stay in school and stay out of trouble. 
My name is uh, Aaron Tremaine Magruder, and I am uh, Travion Smith's brother. Uh, from far as I know, from what my I've seen and what other family members have told me, I've, I only have a like a couple of family members that went to college. Uh, most of them have criminal backgrounds, including my father. So um, I definitely didn't want to go down that that same path. A lot of times, like the particular time when I um, gave him some of my clothes, uh, they they couldn't fit me at the time, but also it was just seeing. You know, how much he, when I would see him, it seemed like he was in need, you know, of not just material things, but and just somebody that cares, you know, and like, it's, I, it's like one of those things you can't really define it or put it in words, but, you know, as humans, we can all feel that type of connection when you feel somebody is lacking something. My name is Corey Tyron Smith, and I'm, I'm Travion's uh, older brother. The initial um, time where I, I knew that he was my brother, I can't I can tell you that because I, I, I don't remember, but I do know, I uh, remember us going on vacation. He was quiet, and um, he was kind of just taking it all in. I can tell it was something that he wasn't used to, um, but for the most part, he was just uh, quiet. Something as simple as going out to eat to a restaurant or... Um, getting sweets, getting ice cream or something like that. Um, I can tell it wasn't something he was quite used to. Do you know why your grandparents raised you and Darius? Um, from what I've been told, um, just, uh, I don't want to sound cruel about it, but I guess you know, my, our mother didn't want us. That's what I've been told. I don't know um, any other way to put it than to put it like that. Um, but from what I've been told, and she left us on several occasions and to the point where my grandparents um, had enough, in a sense, and so they took us in. And did your grandparents, how, did they sort of feel like they had more capacity to take in um, Aaron and Travion when they were born? No, ma'am. Um, would it be fair to say that they had sort of had enough with their daughter at that point? Yes, ma'am. Um, my name is Christina Love. Travion is my brother. We have the same father and different mothers. Who is your father? His name is Michael Clark. How would you describe Michael Clark as a parent? Um, very selfish, very malicious, and negligent. Very cold, didn't really care too much about anything other than himself, if that makes sense. While you were there, you could see him, how he treated Travion. How did he treat Travion? Um, he, he treated him like the outsider, like he never really wanted him to be there in the first place. Like it was more of a burden than it was a joy for him to be his father. Did you ever see times when um, your dad would punish Travion? Yes. In any way possible, physically leaping on him, punching him, hitting him with things, throwing him, just everything in any way possible how he wanted to, I guess. Have you talked with your father about testifying today? I did. And what did he tell you about your decision to testify? I'm sorry. Um, his exact words, am I able to say his exact words? Um, his exact words were, kiss my ass, fuck you bitch, and burn in hell. He said specifically that 
his past did not have anything to do with Travion and things that he has done or how he has raised him as a parent was not important. He didn't want to me to reveal any of the things about who he was as a person and who he was as a parent. I just heard testimony from Christina Love. Is she any relationship to you? She's my daughter. When I would interact with him, I would give him the same amount of love and time and talk to him and the things that I would with any normal child. And it got to the point where he had asked me to be his mommy if I would take care of him the way I took care of Christina. Obviously, I told Travion that it wasn't my decision that I would have to talk to his dad about it and see what he said. And so when I brought it up to Michael that I was willing to do this and be there for him and be in his life. Michael said he would do it, but it was conditional that I had to take him back in order to have Travion. I couldn't have just Travion without him being back in my life. Was that acceptable to you? No, absolutely not. The court would also hear from a number of psychologists and experts that all evaluated Travian throughout his years growing up. So at the time that I had Travian, he was really young. So, um, and, you know, one of my concerns was um, that he was highly impressionable and highly influenced. I remember a joke going around that, you know, someone said he was, said it was snowing and it was July and he ran to the window to look out. I mean, but that's... Yeah. I thought that he needed a very high level of intervention. Um, my my biggest concern for him was that I felt, if I was to draw an analogy, that we were basically treating, you know, cancer with an aspirin. And I thought that, and I and I had suggested his father to sell everything, live in a tent next to a residential facility if you have to, get him into. Uh, get him somewhere where he'd get the, the, the uh, level of treatment he needed. The reason why his father said he wasn't able to get him into long-term treatment was because he couldn't afford, um, could afford it financially, and, uh, and the way that his life was structured, he wouldn't be able to you know, make the adjustments there that, that something like that would have required. Travion had a variety of early diagnoses, um, beginning at age six when he first became involved in the mental health system. Travion was in separate setting, self-contained classes for students with behavioral and dis emotional disorders throughout his school career. He was initially identified in kindergarten and served in separate setting classes in elementary school and then when he moved to middle school he was at Longview which is a public separate special education school serving only students with IEPs. In our school so we work with lots of kids who have whose kind of first response to stress is aggression so you can imagine if you have a whole school for those kids you have a lot of aggressive incidents um, and so it is not, it, we have, unfortunately, we have times where teachers have to physically intervene with kids. And we also have timeout rooms where kids who are a danger themselves or others kind of go to calm down. Um, and Travion was one of the students who went through our whole program the six months he was with us and never needed to be physically restrained or use the timeout room, which is a big deal. We give an award every week for kids who are able to solve the problems without having adults intervene. And then when you graduate, um, we have a big plaque on the wall that for folks who never had to have adults help them solve their problems. When Travion left Longview School, he was placed in a day treatment program for adolescents called Puzzle Pieces. It was a relatively new treatment and was supposed to provide more emotional and mental health support than was possible for us to provide in the school setting. I worked with Travion at Puzzle Piece uh, day treatment 
uh, from about January 2007 to somewhere around July, August 2009. I must admit that he was one of my favorite people. He's one of your favorites? Favorite, yes, he was. Why was that? Um, simply, he was, uh, of course, he loved basketball. I'm an ex-basketball player and coach, so we had that in common. But uh, also, he was uh, just a kind, loving, respectful kid. He, uh, he came in with an attitude that uh, he wanted to do the right thing, and we all admired that about him. I remember his father coming in, wanting to be a part, wanting to help, but literally didn't know how. Once the penalty phase was finished, the jury would have to again make a difficult decision. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you have agreed on your verdict in the recommendation of sentencing in the case of the state of North Carolina versus Travion Smith. We the ju jury unanimously recommend that the defendant Travion Smith be sentenced to life imprisonment. Is this your recommendation? Do you still assent there too? Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm going to ask the clerk to now ask each of you individually. She's going to begin with your four person uh, to respond to a question to ensure that. This was another one of those rather difficult cases for me to work on. The sheer horror where eight year old Hannah had discovered her mother's bloodied body, then running out into the mercy of the street, hoping that someone would stop to help her, at times really left me a little more shaken up than I'd like to admit. And I know that I get to say this from the comfort of my desk, not like the construction workers, EMS, and police who were the first on scene, let alone Hannah herself. But before I can further put my thoughts down regarding the more emotional elements of this case, I do think it's important to address the state's argument. Whether one believes Travian is guilty or innocent, one surely must admit that the direct evidence gathered in this case was minimal at best. Footprints that were barely usable, and testimony from a convicted felon trying to get significant time off of his sentence, was the extent of what I saw presented. I have no doubt that Travian was present on the night, but I do feel conflicted about whether he was in the room at that moment of the murder. It's something that I hear all of the time. In a court of law, guilt must be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. And if Travian had been alone on these robberies, I would be pretty close to the beyond reasonable doubt line. But seeing as he was with Ron that night, someone who seemed to be driving the ship both within these robberies and the relationship that he shared with Travian in general, I do have my doubts about Travian's role in this crime. I won't say too much more regarding my thoughts on this part of the trial though, as I'd like for you to be able to formulate your own opinion about the facts, without too much influence from me. Instead, I'll focus on another aspect of it, which is Travian's childhood. Something I so often hear again, and firmly agree with, is that a bad childhood does not equate to a bad person. So many people, some of which whom I regard as close friends, have had less than ideal upbringings. And in the face of this, they would never even think to hurt another person. I wanted to make this point clear, so that as I talk about Travian's childhood, it does not appear as though I'm trying to excuse a convicted murderer, or minimalize the damage of this crime overall. These thoughts are me musing over a scenario and case that I have had the ability to observe. At a point in time there, Travian was nothing more than an innocent child. There was a moment in his life where no acts of criminal intent had ever been committed. And when I think about young Travian in this sense, it does sadden me. By everything that I've researched, he was a bright and active young boy. One that could have had a beautiful future had he possibly found clearer direction. One part that stood out for me in the testimonies was that of his older brother Corey, who said that what he remembers of Travian was that the young boy would always copy what he did. He would wear his clothes the same way, do his laces in the same style, and all round try to walk, talk, and act like his older brother. To add on to this, one of the psychologists who analysed Travian would say that the young boy would do anything to please the adults around him, and when he accomplished this task, he really felt a strong sense of pride within himself. I feel as though without a stable mother figure and an abusive father, he was always looking for someone to look up to, asking his sister's mother if she could adopt him, and trying to impress any adults that were around. I see this as a sign that he was showing these people that look, I'm worth something. I'm worth more than what the adults around me can emotionally provide. 
It would seem that this behavior of seeking someone to impress and to look up to was not isolated to his childhood, as he transferred that behavior onto Ronald Anthony, doing anything that his friend asked, and spending almost every waking second with him shortly after their first meeting. The harrowing tale of Travian's childhood, juxtaposed against the horror of what he is convicted of doing, is something that is nothing less of a tragedy in my mind, from every angle that I look at it. Turning my attention away from this man, I now think about Melissa and her family, just like so many of these cases that we look at. This is heartbreaking beyond belief. By everything that I could find, Melissa was nothing but a beautiful person, doing everything right from the moments she left school up until her death. She married her high school sweetheart, started a family, and built a career, and then she had gotten to a point in her life where she needed a change. She attempted to try and shift things around, and that would have hopefully resulted in positivity for her and her family. This shift came in the form of a divorce and a subsequent move to a location that would see her closer to friends and family, support for her and her children, and a new chapter for them all. I find it a bitter pill to swallow when I acknowledge that this decision ultimately led to her death. This is because I am a big believer in making positive change in one's life. I preach this for my life, my friends and my family, and anyone who is listening to this right now. If life has become a burden that feels more like an on-rail simulation through the pits of depression, anxiety and suffering, then please do your best to take it by the horns and regain control. And with that being said, my time researching this case has really rattled something within me that I did not think was possible to be rattled. Melissa was doing what she needed to do to try and attain her little slice of peace in this world, for her and her family, and it resulted in pain for all of them. I will still always believe that making positive change is the right way for people to go. I have to believe that. But every time I think about this now, or talk about it, this story of Melissa's tragedy will always be in the corner of my mind. I now wonder what will become of Hannah, how this will affect her life moving forward. No person is equipped to deal with finding their loved ones like that, let alone an eight-year-old child. I wonder if the pain that was transferred to her by the idiotic decisions of two reckless young men will define her life in a negative light, or will she be able to use this experience moving forward as strength to remember her mother for the woman that she was, someone who was doing her best for them all, and someone whom everyone around had nothing but positive words to say. Only time will tell, and I truly hope with all that I have that Hannah and her brother Noah are able to move through this world with ease. Travian and Ronald received life sentences, but so did these children. Mental and emotional shackles that will try to bring them down when they think about their mother in this light, and I truly hope that they will be able to overcome these bindings. It would appear that the ripples of this tragedy were felt far and wide, not only through Melissa's family, but also through her community. And this can most potently be seen through the victim impact statements of her parents, as they presented their love for their daughter in a way that no parent should ever have to do. Your life matters to your family and friends. No child should have to grow up in the manner that you did. But at some point, you learn the difference between right and wrong. We first learned you have a young child from Sarah Redden's testimony. And it's our hope that you will never see him again, as we will never see our daughter again. And Noah and Hannah will never see their mother again. Maybe if you are out of his life, and he is fortunate enough to be raised by a good family, he will have a better chance of making something of himself. Maybe he will grow up to have love and respect for others. You took away my daughter and my grandchildren's mother, but you cannot take away the many wonderful memories we all have <coughs> of our Melissa. You need to have your skull crushed, your nose broke and laying on the side of your face, your jaw broken in two places, your teeth knocked out, your carotid arteries severed and multiple other wounds. 
such that you suffer and slowly bleed to death. That is what you really deserve. Our prayers are for your son and for our grandchildren. I never thought that a murderer would have a significant impact on my life. <clears throat> Primarily because I've kept myself and my family out of questionable environments. It's evident to me that our world, our nation, our communities, and even our homes are not a safe haven from people who don't value life. We heard last week from teachers and coaches and social workers, parents, grandparents, and neighbors tried to make a uh, positive impact on your life, Travion. But when one is so overly confident, cocky, that he doesn't value anyone's guidance, there's not much way to help. I've been surprised throughout this trial with the lack of concern that you have for these proceedings that would determine where or how you would spend the rest of your life. For example, you know, laying your head on the table in front of them while there were testimonies going on on your behalf or whatever, as if they were not important. I've also been surprised with the total lack of emotion shown by you, but I guess if you don't put value in life, <coughs> you wouldn't have taken our daughter's life. Would Travion's family like to spend some more time with him? I'm sure they would. We would love to spend some more time with our daughter, and we don't have that opportunity. That was a concerning factor of her moving to Raleigh so that she could be close to her family and friends, folks she grew up with. She had made plans to, to visit and spend time, had already spent time with some of her high school classmates. Now we don't have that opportunity anymore. <clears throat> 